You're playing so pathetic. I have to yell. Excuse me? I have to yell, which you don't like. Hey everyone, how are you? How's everyone doing on this wonderful Sunday afternoon? I am so glad to be here with you all on this sunny, hot day in Los Angeles, um, where traffic is terrible because there's a giant sporting event happening. <laughs> Thank you for choosing to be here with us today, and I hope that you all have a wonderful rest of your day, whether you choose to watch the football game or not. Um, all right let's go through i'm going to talk a lot at the top of this panel and then i'm going to throw it over to this amazing team of people that we we have as panelists today okay announcements there's a lot of them first of all my name is ellen um, i'm the executive director at the hollywood fringe festival my pronouns are she and they for a quick visual description i am a white woman with bangs and a non uh uh, contagious rash that happens to me because of some autoimmune disorders. Um, I have um, brown hair, long brown hair, and I'm wearing a you know, uh, gray tank top. My background has a half-painted wall that I'm almost finished with and a painting that I got off of my Buy Nothing group that has some flowers and some pears inside of it. Um, I'm in my office. Welcome to our budgeting and fundraising panel. We have some amazing folks here today that are here to give you their expertise. Um, I just want to remind everybody that we are live streaming. Hey, Facebook, hope that you are here with us. Um, if you are in the Zoom room, feel free to rename yourself um, and include your pronouns and your show. Information on how to rename yourself is going into the chat. Tons of upcoming dates to be aware of. Don't worry. We're dropping a link in the chat with all a blog post with all of these dates in it. So you do not need to write them down. There's actually even a link inside of there for you to add it to your Google Calendar so that it's just there with reminders um, before the event that'll pop up on your calendar as well. All right, tons of things. Townhouses here are hybrid. We're gonna do an in-person element and then they're also gonna be live streamed to YouTube and all are recorded. Those are hosted by Fringe staff and are about how to fringe from our organization's perspective. We had our first one last week and we have another one coming up in April. Um, most of our things come up, uh, most of our events are workshops and panels because we want to provide the perspective of our, of our amazing community or award-winning presenters. So something like this, 
is a workshop and panel, and we're doing them digitally this year on Zoom and Facebook Live. These will also be recorded and um, will be posted afterwards on our YouTube channel and are always going to be on our Facebook. Um, we have these workshops obviously have started. This is our second one, and we will run through May 8th. Coming up in the next month is Accessibility at the Fringe, where we'll talk about how to make your show accessible. That is coming up on Thursday, February 24th, 7 to 9 p.m. And then our Marketing and Ticketing Workshop, which is Sunday, March 13th, exactly a month from today. Um, actually, it's a Sunday. Uh, Sunday, March 13th, 12 to 2. Office Hours is back. Join us this Wednesday for our last off-season Office Hours, um, 7 to 10 at the Broadwater Plunge for what we call off season because we are about to launch into the in season in March. Um, we will have a dollar off drinks, talk with the fringe staff about your show, dip your toe into the fringe community. Um, to be fair or to be aware, uh, you will need to bring a proof of vaccination as well as a mask um, and it is 21 plus. Um, we have our amazing office hour season that is going to start in late March. And to kick that off, I'm announcing today um, a fundraiser, a party that we will be hosting um, to kick that all off at three clubs. That is a new thing. Um, and we are going to have a li uh, live entertainment. We're going to party like it's 2019 and kind of bring back our fringe spirit into the community. After that, we'll have um, office hours March 30th through June 1st. Um, every Wednesday in bars. Um, so that is a big series where all of our amazing participants come together in different bars around Hollywood. We move locations every week um, from 7 to 10 every Wednesday um, to kind of get together, be in community, share each other's uh, pro promotional materials, things like that. Uh, more info about that is going into the chat with all of the dates, the COVID info, things like that. Whew, whew, okay. We are also hosting an additional three digital office hours to make the preseason more accessible to out-of-town fringers and out-of-COVID consideration for those that aren't comfortable. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention about our uh, office hour series is some will be outdoors and some will be indoors. So there's both options for people. Um, the digital office hours will be running April 7th, April 28th, and May 19th. And those are also in that blog post. So all of these registrations are in our blog post. Please take a look. Start to add these things into your calendar. It's so important to be in the community together. And you guys are already doing it today by showing up for this panel. So thank you so much. And I'm going to move on to the next part. Ground rules, housekeeping. If you have any accessibility needs that aren't being met, don't uh, hesitate to reach out to any member of staff. And we'll do our best to accommodate. Also, if you need an interpreter for any of our upcoming events, email support 72 hours in advance of any event, and we'll schedule one. Um, we will have an interpreter available at all in-person events this year. We don't have many rules at Fringe, other than don't be a jerk. We take our code of conduct very seriously. If you register as a project, you and your team will be held accountable for your actions as you participate within the festival, as you should be in any professional environment you choose to take part in. Um, we strive here to make sure that we have a safe space so that anyone who wants to participate can make the most honest and cutting edge work that the city has done. <clears throat> There's a link in the chat about what this means at Fringe. Have fun today. Know we're all learning how to virtually fringe alongside you. Tech issues, bound to happen. <laughs> feel free to DM a Fringe staffer if you need any Zoom support. Uh, this is a supportive space, so feel free to get up, eat while you're uh, on Zoom, or um, drink anything. We are not going to judge you, even if you are on camera. Um, and. Last but certainly not least, we'll be holding all live questions today until the end of the stream, but feel free to throw some in the chat. And if it fits in with what we're, what we're talking about, we might address it earlier on. All right, this is the biggie, COVID chat. <laughs> all right, so we're all coming into this year, uh, new year of the pandemic with different boundaries and expectations. Some of us have worked every single day of this pandemic in person. Some of us have been working from home and this is our first foray back into the community. And our first thing that we want to mention is that we're all coming to this differently and we all need to understand that so that we can treat each other with respect and dignity and love as people express their boundaries to each other. We of course have our own guidelines which are being dropped in or well, which are on our website. They're in, at support.hollywoodfringe.org if you would like to read deeply into that. Um, we should really respect each other's boundaries of touch and social distance as we learn to navigate this new normal. Our guidelines are clear, masks are required inside, but we know that our space um, exists outside of these boundaries, on sidewalks and other outdoor spaces. 
If you're talking with somebody and they ask you to maybe put your mask on while they're talking to you, just do it. And then afterwards you can say, hey, I actually want to be in a conversation where I don't have to wear my mask. So I'm going to go over there with my friend over there and we'll talk about this later. Maybe send me an email. So there's a way for you to be able to express that boundary while also holding space for that person's needs. Um, setting expectations of general support is going to be our way to get through this because we know that it's going to be different for everyone. Additionally, um, we know that things are going to be loosened. We made our guidelines so tight so that we could loosen instead of having to tighten them further. We expect that we'll be able to have different audience guidelines when they come out on April 18th. We expect that we will be able to even loosen some of our participant guidelines, like the fact that um, unvaccinated people need to perform with masks at this moment. We had to create these guidelines during a search. And so we did our best to say, if this was the worst that was happening in June, how could we keep our, our uh, people safe? How could we predict what guidelines are coming out through LA County when they drop again? And how can we make sure that we can adjust by making things easier and not making people have to re-navigate this whole new process with their cast? Um, so as I said, things are gonna be movable. Things are gonna be um, a little crazy as we're building, but nothing will get tighter. And the only thing that'll happen is that we're gonna be able to loosen due to the lower the lowering of um, the, the threat in our county. So we'll kind of see that as things kind of move forward. And if you have any questions about that, talk to us at office hours. We're really going to be kind of uh, navigating that with community input. And the best place to do that is to talk to us in person or to send us an email at support at hollywoodfringe.org if you're not available. All right, all right, all right. I've talked a lot. <laughs> Before we get started with our panelists, make sure that you are engaging now with HFF. 22. We always use a hashtag HFF22 to um, be able to share each other's marketing throughout the year. So start to use that hashtag. Make sure you're signed up for Fringe emails. There's a link for that in our on the homepage of our website. Follow our social media. We're at Hollywood Fringe everywhere and um, email support at HollywoodFringe.org as we have questions that come through. Okay. Before I pass it over to our panelists, I'm going to launch a fun poll because I've never done a poll and I'm excited to do this. Um, have you done Hollywood Fringe before? Um, click in, tell us if you're a first time producer, if you've done HFF before, if you've done HFF a lot, let us know. I see a lot of first time producers. Ooh, it's pretty even, pretty even. Let's see. Okay, let's see as people answer. We got 15 seconds left in our poll. Got 45% right now. Oh, 50% first time producers. Okay, we got it. Okay, so as, I, as you're kind of seeing in the poll results, I'll show you in just a second. You're not alone if you're a first time producer and you're not alone if you've done this a lot. Our community is full of people who are excited to get to know you and are excited to answer your questions. We are always so excited to know that we have new producers every year and our veterans are here to be your friend and to help you navigate this crazy little festival that could Adult summer camp, we're ready. All right, let me give you a little history of Fringe and then I'm gonna be really quiet and everybody else is gonna talk except for me. Okay, so, little history of Fringe. The Hollywood Fringe is an annual open access, community-derived performing arts event that happens each June, except for last year because of the pandemic, it happened in August. Um, participation in the Hollywood Fringe is completely open and uncensored by opening the gate to anyone with a vision, the festival is able to offer um, and exhibit the most diverse and cutting edge work that the city has to offer. That doesn't mean that you have to have weird or fringy work. It's just big. There's different thing. There's different strokes for different folks. There's ton tons of different um, work happening from very serious to very funny and, um, and comedic. So we have a smattering of that today on the panel. And we also have a smattering of that available um, on the rest of the panels that are happening this year. All right, I am going to add the spotlight to our amazing people, have them introduce themselves with their name, their pronouns, their visual description, and a little history of what they've done at HFF. I'm gonna call on Boule to go first because she's first on my, uh, my thing, so go ahead. 
Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for having me, Ellen and Lois and Carly. Happy to be here. My name is Kristen Boulay. Um, a lot of people call me Boulay. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. Um, I decided to be Ellen's twin today because we're wearing the same exact thing. <laughs> I'm also wearing, and mine's black, you said yours is gray. I'm wearing a black sleeveless top. Um, my hair is much shorter than Ellen's, but same dark color. Um, <laughs> so I knew I had to look fabulous. Um, and then I'm sitting in my dining room in front of a brick, no, actually wallpaper brick, uh, wall um, with some windows. Um, my little dog's on one side and my cat's on the other. Um, yeah. That's all you wanted, right? Yeah, and then what? Okay. At Fringe, have you Sorry, done your my history? history at Fringe? Yeah. Oh, I've done a lot of Fringe. I've done uh, <laughs> um, my company, Two Cents Theater Group, has produced at Fringe since twenty. 15, I think was our first year, or 16 maybe was our first year, and we produced um, one show probably the first two years, and then two to three shows for every year following that. Um, and now also we're a Loose Change Experiences, which is our immersive wing, which has done immersive for the last many years. Um, and then I also have produced a lot of solo shows and other people's uh, smaller projects um, as well. Thank you so much. Yeah. Layla, do you want to go next? Absolutely. Hi, I am Layla Abdo. I am an Arab American uh, young woman, I guess. And I'm wearing a floral print top with kind of an interesting neckline, a little shoulder wink kind of thing. I'm sitting in my office. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm sitting in my office. And so there's a bookshelf behind me. Uh, these are all our serious books. <laughs> and I'm in a very cozy desk chair right now. My history with Fringe is I first participated as an uh, actor slash cultural consultant for a play uh, echoes I, in 2018, I believe. And then I applied after really enjoying the community to have a fringe scholarship to be a producer for the first time. I did win uh, for my solo show from Ada Zatar, which I would be doing a meal to go along with my kind of journey talking about my last and most recent trip to Lebanon. In light of COVID, I decided that was a mistake. And so I pivoted, thanks to support from Ellen and Lois and the entire team at Fridge, I pivoted to producing my ensemble show Tribe instead last August, which is the story of the first all Arab American improv team. Thanks so much, Layla. And last but certainly not least, John, you wanna go? Hello, I'm John Wukti. Uh, I'm the only male identifying panelists today. I'm a man of a certain age. I'm sitting, <laughs> in my, I'm sitting uh, seasoned. I'm sitting in my uh, office. I'm wearing my Scarlet Fever t-shirt, which was the show I did in 2019. Behind me is my keyboard and my drum and a set of high heels for my new show, Housewife 52. I also have whiteboard and corkboard with calendar of outlining what the next five months are for fringe i have my budget on the board it's uh, okay so that's that's what that is and uh my fringe i acted and directed several shows and then in 2019 i mounted my full project scarlet fever physical movement theater with music uh and that did very well and I'm now going to be doing Housewife 52, which now has seven songs. So I have now moved in to the musical category for that. And that is where I am. So exciting. Thank you so much. Oh, Kristen, go I ahead. Just, just counted. I think I've done 14 friend shows. Oh my gosh. Yes. That's insane. <clears throat> I love Pain. the best part about our community is that people truly do come back. There is a home for a lot of people here at Fringe, especially when you're kind of navigating that LA theater scene and trying to find your niche. Sometimes that niche is here. And sometimes that niche starts here and expands to other places. And so it feels really exciting to have people who come back year after year. So cool. Um, so really quickly, we're dropping in the chat some information. It's so funny. I saw a question in the chat about how to budget. 
we ha have found it very difficult to talk to talk exact numbers on a panel like this. It's just like then you get into the nitty gritty. So instead, we have put out a request to a lot of veteran producers to submit uh, budgets from the past ten years of Fringe to kind of talk about where they have um, come from, where they started, how much they paid for venues, how much they paid for this. Mm. It's all anonymous. And we're gonna keep it that anonymous way so that people can kind of navigate that um, that, that and, and feel more comfortable sharing exact numbers that went into their fringe production. We have two on the blog right now. I already got another one in my email that I haven't had time to add into the doc yet. And there will be more coming in the coming weeks from solo shows all the way up to ensembles. We have two ensemble shows up there right now. We're adding another ensemble show. I know that we're going to have a solo show coming up. So know that there is some examples. So you can kind of start to decide what is your fringe experience going to look like? How have people spent before? There's also um, budgets on the blog from 2015, 2013, other things like that. So if you want to Google Hollywood Fringe budget, <laughs> um, there's a couple articles about this. So you can kind of start to navigate that on your own. That being said to my dear panelists, how do you budget for the festival? Does most of the money come from out of your pocket or do you fundraise costs up front um, typically? And if anybody has an answer first, they can jump in. Uh, sure, I'll go first. I'm probably a, a little more unique because uh, I have had a, a company that goes on for the last decade. So we have done a full season rather than just doing um, fringe. That being said, um, most of it has always come out of my pocket, uh, which is something that is hopefully changing um, here in the in the near future. So we're always on a like you know spend as little as we. We can. We've did fundraising earlier our years, and now we just try to come up with the money. <laughs> to be honest, so um, yeah, <laughs> that's a terrible answer. I, Sorry, I'm Layla, you go. Say both. Yeah, Chris and Chloe <laughs> saying um, that I uh, ideally try not to, you know, burn money. But I did front the money for my production for the most part. I did have help from the scholarship, which was very much wanted and appreciated. <laughs> but I actually have experienced as like an actor hyphen writer, the multi-hyphenate situation of I've produced kind of pilot presentations and indie shorts of my writing before. And so since I wrote my play, I saw this as an investment of being able to take what would have been a production budget for like a sizzle reel and instead put it on at fringe and actually get feedback and try that avenue of getting buzz instead of the festival circuit, which isn't particularly my favorite, the indie film festival circuit, to be clear. So. <laughs> um, this is my money. I, I, I'm lucky that I, I've had many years, you know, a very flexible job. I know that's not everyone's uh, story in life. Um, it's it's all my money. Um, uh, I do not, this is a big conversation uh, to have with different people about the idea of fundraising. Um, I, I'm sort of a firm believer that once you budget and you figure out, okay, I need $5,000. Let's just throw that number out there. I feel one should have that money going into it. I think it's very dangerous to say, we're gonna kickstart. We're gonna do, we're gonna do a fundraiser. We're gonna do a party. Number one, it's gonna stress you out that, that that's a whole other aspect of your production that you don't have the money. Um, and then you also have to remember you're gonna kickstart your friend's gonna kickstart. Everyone's gonna be taking $20 and just passing it around a table. So it's really difficult, you know, if you have friends and family like outside of our theater world, I would almost go to them. Because if you ask me, I'm gonna be thinking, I'd love to help them, but I'm doing a show. So uh, that that's, you know, that's my thought on the fundraising. I think you should, really know where the access to your money is going to come when you set things in motion because it's it's an unadded stress to have to it's enough to mount it latest like i know it's enough to to, to mount a show so if at the same time 
every day you're thinking, oh, I need a couple hundred dollars more. You know, it's going to stress you out. Now I know that if people want to do a show and you'll do it however you can. And that's what I love about the fringe community. But, but that's my feeling to kind of know where that money is going to be and, and figure that out before <clears throat> you start. So you don't have that extra stress. Leah, go ahead. I've got to say also kind of uh, a sidebar to that. Whenever I was focused on producing my solo show versus an ensemble, I think that is a very clear distinction in this conversation. When I was producing my solo show, uh, because of panels and networking stuff, uh, I think you can also expand your idea of what fundraising means. Sometimes it is a more donation focused situation. Like, uh, because my focus was on Lebanese food for the solo show, I went to different restaurants. Unfortunately, I was not successful in receiving donations. I received like, you can have a percent off. And it's like, well, I'm actually doing the majority of the cooking, but you know, it's fine. And so, um, so there, there are ways that you can also expand what that means. If for me, I am always very passionate, um, because as an actor in LA, you don't always get paid your worth. Generally never, you never get paid your worth in LA. Uh, but I'm very passionate of paying people with the understanding of like, thank you for maybe potentially taking, you know, a different kind of situation uh, and giving that to this production. You know, there are ways that you can communicate you enjoy the value of what somebody's bringing to the table. Maybe that's asking for a design favor. Maybe that's asking for um, some bouncing off ideas with design. My director's um, partner actually did our sound design for our show last year. And he did that, you know, for free. I consider that maybe not fundraising, but I consider that a valuable donation that saved us money in a tab that really upped our produ production value. Your production value isn't always tied to a dollar but it is still tied to time. So. Yeah, I think that a lot of fringe shows run off of volunteerism and having like, who do you know in your network? Who is your, oh, my friend's partner's an architect and they can build me a background uh, that I needed uh, out of some donated materials and then you're like done. Um, or, or some things like that. I think that's a great way to look at it. Where can you save? Where is your network? And then what are you going to have to pay for? Because I think that that's going to be different depending on who is who's who you are, who you have in your network. Your budget's going to look different. Um, your best friend is a stage manager and can like, or your best friend's a producer and can produce your show and uh, your best friend's a graphic designer and can make all of your materials. There are some ways like that to say, I, I do want to talk a little bit more about fundraising. Can I, can I add one more thing to that? Yeah. One? And maybe yeah. we're going to ask this. I think another important if you will, psychological uh, to wrap your head around a first time producer is profit and loss. So if you are going into this thinking you're gonna make money, it's highly, it's possible. I'm not gonna say it's not, but it, it in you'll notice in those budgets uh, I like having in my Excel calculator, my budget, potential audience at a ticket price. I see the, you know, what possibly I'm going to lose, 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 lose. Oh, here's the tipping point. I might make some money. So I think it's very important if you, again, I'll just use 5,000. Okay. So how can I make that 5,000 back? That's going to get you into this treadmill of another stress. Now you as an individual have to accept or understand the number that you are okay losing and not being out of rent or not being really depressed. You need to say, okay, I'm spending this potentially at a 50% audience. I'm going to make this. I'm going to lose $2,000. Am I okay with that? You, I, I, that's, I think that's really important because I do feel some people think, oh, I'm going to make money or I'm going to break even. Now, again, I'm doing a musical. Some people do a one-person show. 
Kristen has her finger up. So that's my, my, that's my thought is I think you need to psychologically prepare yourself of what you are willing to lose. Oh, Kristen, go. Yeah, I was just, I was just noting that I had something to say next. Didn't mean to rush you, John. No, I com I completely agree with what John's saying that you should definitely go in um, not expecting to make money. Um, you should be planning to not, not make any of it back. That being said, though, I would also like to note that Fringe is the most affordable place to do a show yes. by far. Definitely. If you do a show outside of Fringe, your venue costs are significantly higher. You have to do a six week run, you know, at prime times. Rent, so it's way, way more expensive to do a show outside of Fringe. So if you're going to lose the money, this is at least less, you know, and, and that being said, it is, I think it is possible. And also I think um, Layla mentioned this earlier. It really depends what your show is too. If you're doing a solo show that you have zero production costs and you're doing everything yourself and you're not paying anybody because no, you, because there's no one there to pay um, then, and you, and you have a hit and you know, it does like you, you should also go in not expecting to have all your shows sold out because it's and especially in these in these weird times you know hopefully by june we'll be not so worried about you know the pandemic but it's tough right now like you just don't know and you can't you know blame yourself especially right now for that um but so you can, you don't know if you're gonna have i've done both shows i've done shows where you have three people in the house and i've done shows where you're where we're packed and adding adding as many seats as you can possibly get in there so it can go either way um um, um so, so in that case, you can totally make make some money back. Um, but if you do, you know, twenty five person immersive shows and musicals like I do, then no, you are never going to make any money whatsoever. So, you know, especially with your scale, I even think at, at any scale, producing is wedding planning. Just period. Producing sure. is wedding planning. You have all these different spreadsheets, and you know, you can be like my best friend from college who is very artistically inclined and was able to make her wedding look extra fancy by taking some of those tasks on herself. Or you can be an outsourcer and how you achieve that outsourcing. And it just it just depends on maximizing skill sets mm -hmm. within knowing that the scale of production at Fringe because of that is also fluctuating because you have a load in time and a load out time. We're not seeing a, you know, the Hamilton wheel set, you know what I mean? We're seeing what theater can be. We're seeing what you can make the space through storytelling. It is story first. And you can really, really capitalize on that and making sure that you're focused on, is this money contributing to not only getting the story out there, but in enhancing it in a reasonable way? Yes. Yeah. I love all of these points are right. And I think that mm -hmm. a big thing to point out is that everybody does fringe differently and to figure out why you do fringe. Are you doing fringe because you've been planning to do a show forever and this is your time to mount it and you're going to take that, that, that bull by the wings or whatever and just do it? Or is it that you're trying to start a theater company? Or is it that you have a theater company and you want to produce your show, um, you know, a, 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 on a bigger platform? Things like that. There's a lot of reasons that people do fringe and it's unique to you and maybe kind of starting to figure that out will kind of help you along the way. Um, I think we're talking a lot about budgeting. So I'm gonna stick in that vein and I wanted to really quickly talk about something that John brought up that I think is really important, which is like your sell through rate. Your sell through rate is how many people you're expecting to be in your house. Mm -hmm. um, you need to realize that at fringe, you're gonna to want to do comps for artist swaps. So people, in the fringe community that you want to switch tickets with. I'm going to see your show for free, you see mine for free. You're going to want tickets set aside for um, like VIPs or uh, press or people that you want to see your show to take it to the next place. That might be award presenters, that might be press, that might be um, people that you just think are important and you want to give them a free ticket. So what is your typical, when you're budgeting, do you budget about 40, 50, 60% of your houses being sold? What do you guys budget? Well, first of all, I would the, uh, the first thing is I always suggest setting your per ticket price higher than you expect people to actually pay for it. We've I very I, I think that it's better to give it's great to give people love discounts and, and so it's better to set it higher and give away tons of discounts. Do co you know because in the fringe um, community it's very you have a huge network that you can give yeah. very accessible discount 
codes um, too. And so you, if you, if you're already got a low ticket price, it makes it harder for you to do that. So I, I recommend setting your price a little higher. And then you'll also have people outside of Fringe who are buying tickets who will pay that full price. Um, but it gives you kind of the, the freedom both ways. So I would first, whatever your ticket price is, knock that down five bucks <laughs> for what the majority, for what people will actually be paying. Um, and then I would say, yeah, maybe I think even, yeah, 40, maybe even, maybe even 30. I think it depends on how big your house is also if, and how ambitious your, um, your space is if you're in a, you know, 30 seat versus a 99 seat makes a difference as well on how, yeah. I think that I was able to capitalize since I produced last year on fringe has become very hybrid. And the more you can capitalize on what that can mean, for me, I grew up in Illinois. I currently live in the Northeast. I was in LA. It was the pandemic. You know, we can list all these different things of, and, and just, just, let's just start with living in LA and getting someone to get in their car to see your show. That, that, that's, that's what you're going to hear at the marketing panel, by the way. How do you get someone to get in their car to see your show? And, and the fact that things are live streamed now is something that can mean that my, my people back in the Midwest were able to support me in a way they haven't been able to in a long time. You know, my people wherever, you know, it's where your people are. I was, I was kind of in an interesting situation that um, we limited live ticket sales because of the pandemic for my cast's uh, comfortability. And I thought that it was important to make people feel safe during that surge instead of money. I mean, I wasn't the person on the stage that so wasn't really my call to make. So I wanted to respect people's boundaries that they made a commitment before things changed. You know, some of that is just flexibility of worst case scenario, what can you fly with? And so we really kind of, we limited our house seats last year to do that instead. My, I, um, I, but when I did my show last time, it, the primary, I wanted people to see the show. I never denied anyone access to come if they didn't have the money. I did a tiered pricing. I started, uh, I, I think 10, then 12, then 15 as the shows progressed. Just, you know, marketing savvy, knowing if you, and our show did well. So, hey, if you have a hit, more people are gonna wanna come see it. And you're also telling people, see it earlier, you'll save a few dollars it gets to the last show, it's going to be a few dollars more expensive. Um, this year I'm doing a musical. I think mm, theater people and people usually understand that extra three to five dollars maybe because hopefully they will go, oof, they got to pay musicians. They, I bet their show costs more money. I don't mind paying more. That doesn't always work. I also want to make sure that people don't confuse the size of their house with the type of audience they're going to get. Don't think, oh, I'm going to get a 99 seat house because then I can get lots and lots of people. N no, I'm going to be in the biggest theater at the Broadwater this year because I physically need a large stage for my work. It has 99 seats. If I had my druthers, would I love the size of that stage with 50 seats? Yes, because I also could have done an equity contract. <laughs> okay, that's a, another panel. Um, so don't just think, oh, I'm on a bigger house because I'm going to get more people in there. Especially if you're a first time producer, you're, you're not sure what's going to happen. Number wise, my show did very well last time. And I feel over the course of five shows plus an additional sixth one as an extension, I want to say 45 to 50 ended up being my average audience. Okay. But as Kristen and Layla know, there might be a time when you have two people in your house. So you need to also be prepared for that. And do you want two people sitting in a 99 seat theater or do you want <laughs> two people sitting in a 35 seat theater? So, you know, it, 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 I know that Sometimes space matters to people, the physical space they're performing on. So balance that. But I don't want first time producers just, John, is that 45 in person? Yes, I did this in 2019. So 
uh, and I, I don't have any desire to stream. There's no streaming in the space I'm in, but I don't do the kind of work that I'm not a fan of the stream, but that's- I'm, I'm the same way. I'm like, yeah, I'm not a- <laughs> That's me. Also streaming a musical is incredibly hard. Yes, it is. Like, yeah. there's, a, there's an extra layer with a musical that you wouldn't have with a solo show or an ensemble show even. Yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to, as Kristen, I don't want to sacrifice that quality. I, I don't, you know, we're not the national theater. <laughs> if we were, you know, I'd do fine if we were, but. I, I'm the same, but also to be totally not knocking the streaming. It's, it's great and awesome for the right thing, but I'm a believer in it's not the right thing for everything. And yeah, I mean, I do mostly immersive now, which is, um, you know, it totally doesn't work for, uh, uh, but, but you can do a show that's streaming. Uh, yeah, so there's GoPro cameras on your actors. Sure. Yeah. I, I will say if anybody is looking into live streaming, um, I was very happy with um, Tim at the Broadwater. He was incredible. I wasn't able to physically be at my show and I got to watch all five performances and my preview and they did a very dynamic camera setup. So just to say, if you are looking at a venue that does a camera setup or you're thinking of your own, ask how many cameras they do. And that will change the experience of if, is it one camera on sticks in the back? Cause then you have to think about audio stuff, but that's a different panel. I did want to put piggyback on something that I John. Just, oh, just really quickly. I want to um, just talk about one thing in the chat about streaming before we move on, we're going to do a tech panel um, and we'll cover a little bit of these challenges. But the truth is, is that with something like a musical or something like that, you really want to have, if you're not comfortable speaking to it, you're going to want to have somebody who's comfortable speaking to it. On sound. Screen. The short answer to that question is sound. Sound is, sound is difficult <laughs> streaming because yeah. of music and because of these things. I think that as you're planning your plan, that just like Lois said in the chat, ask your venue because most venues will have experience with this. Um, every not every, most p venues have done streaming during the pandemic. If not in-house, then with contractors and things like that. So just talk to your venue about what they've seen. Um, because, and then we're also gonna have a tech panel where we're gonna touch on it, but live stream is a whole other conversation that we'll be having later this year. Um, go ahead, Layla. Yeah, I wanted to piggyback something that John said about you wanna have you want the 35 or the 99 seats usually. You want the smallest theater you can get away with and still be happy with your venue. And I think part of that that wasn't also said is what's really interesting about Fringe is there are a lot of encore opportunities. And that is related to how you do as a producer oftentimes. Did you sell out and you needed the opportunity to show your show again? This is venue based. Sometimes there's the encore awards for that um, ring of theater that are all connected. This is the whole thing. It's very easy to access, but there is an encore opportunity available so that you can look and say, am I doing one show? Am I doing three shows in a preview? Am I doing five shows in a preview? Am I doing seven? And really just be calculating the number of, of seats. And I mean, more days doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna fill up the 25 person thing either. I think that also that's so interesting and it's something we brought up at our town hall where people have added shows if that was possible because of the small house size and it really is a great thing to be able to know that you can manage the number of seats in your venue instead of being like i don't know if i can sell these tickets because the truth is that you're going to get some of your audience from fringe but you can't build your whole audience from fringe your audience also needs to come from your network especially when you're thinking about making money off of ticket sales you need to know what your network looks like. Um, and I just really quickly, um, yes, people have added shows, but it's very rare. It depends on your venue. Depends on your venue, big time. It depends big on your venue. People have done that. Um, but it, it, basically, start to think about the number you can sell out. And then, like Layla said, there's other opportunities for you to do your show again. You know what it, sell out show is a good thing. And yeah. uh, talking about like number of shows, there have been many cases of a first time producer, suddenly huge hit. Okay, yeah. you never know. So that's last time I did five shows. We were successful. So I'm, I'm coming with, you know, a past show. Now I'm doing a new show. I'm doing seven this year because I feel 
I just, I feel that's good. And, you know, as an artist, you know, the less shows, the sort of more depressing it is because you do it, it's done, it's over. So I balanced, I was like, okay, I think we can do seven and we'll do well with that. So that's another don't also, I feel like I've seen first time producers. I have 13 shows <laughs> because somehow thinking, oh, oh my gosh, look at all these opportunities. I'm going to get so many audience. I'm going to make so much money. It can happen, but don't bring, don't, don't think the more shows you do, the more audience you're going to get. I mean, honestly, sometimes what it is, it's the more opportunity to have two people in the house. Oh, something you said earlier, John, that back in just a sec uh, that I wanted to pay back on to was um, back to the ticket cost um, does depend on what category you're into. You can charge more, like you were saying, with musical immersive theater, you can totally charge more. If you're doing a solo show, you're one of like, I don't know how many solo shows are there usually like a hundred ish, right? Yeah. Is that, is that There's a lot. Um, a I don't lot, know, yeah. but you can see in the breakdown, especially during the pandemic, as people shrink down their cast size, it's really popular. Yeah. It was even popular before that. Yeah. But totally like, and also the amount of people, if you have a show with 25 people in it, you're going to probably sell some more tickets because you have more cast, put more people pushing the show, bring people to the show. If you're a solo show, it's just you. So the work, it's, it's harder. It's the, you got the work, more work cut out for you as far as, you know, getting butts in the seats. So, um, and you're competing with a lot of shows and a lot of solo shows are free. A lot of them just don't charge anything or five bucks, you know, so you really, I mean, I can't, yeah, so you want to really be careful if you're in a bigger category with a lot, a lot of shows, you need to watch those ticket prices even more. Layla, hold that thought really quick. Um, and then I will come to you first. Um, I'm dropping in the chat really quick an annual report. In our annual report, you see all of the trends from 2019 and, 20, and 2021. We added in as much information from both as we've started to track trends so that you can kind of take a look into um, that like category breakdown, that um, information that you might be looking at that Kristen is kind of mentioning just by knowing as being a part of the community, you start to know these things. But if you're a new person, um, that's a great way to kind of look into the, the, the average ticket price, the average number of tickets sold. Um, we have started to make that very um, transparent. We also started to make transparent what Fringe is spending and how um, the money that you're donating to Fringe is, is where it's going to. There's a breakdown of 2019, 2021, and we'll continue that for years to come because it's just a good tool to kind of be able to benchmark. Layla, and then I have something else to- I just finish, kind of finish real quick where I was before, sorry, real quick. And then also what John was just saying as well, I um, seconding the um, how many performances to have, I think also goes right in line with what I was just saying with how, depending, it, it, that can also be relative to what kind of show you're having. If you're, if it's just yeah. you, you have, you have less, you know, manpower going into getting people in those seats. Like I think five performances is very reasonable for, you know, for a lot of solo shows. Um, but if you're doing a musical, you know, then you might, I think I've always done at least seven for musicals for sure, but never 13. That's very ambitious for Fringe. And also you don't want, this may be going to another category, but you don't want all prime time stuff either. You, some people come into Fringe thinking, oh, I got to get those Friday, Saturday, Sunday nights. Boom. You, those are very competitive times. I highly recommend off weekend times. I love trying to get those Wednesday and Thursday night shows in there. Great. Daytime, Saturday, Sunday afternoons are great show times for Fringe. So don't go in thinking that you need that you're going to go in and lock in those prime time every weekend, that's going to get you in trouble. So, so don't be too ambitious with how many shows you do, unless you're an immersive and you have very small audiences, that's a different case. And I would also say that you can do less than five too. I know a lot of first time producers start out with three. Three is a really um, like an average number as well. Three to five has been like newer producers. And then as people kind of get deeper into the community, they kind of get to know their audience and build to, something larger, three to six is pretty typical. And there's a lot of like four, five show packages, four show packages, three show packages at yeah. certain theaters. And remember, Bob, uh, I assume all venues kind of do this, you know, they, they you, there's package deals. Cause it's easier it for them yeah. to schedule. And then, you know, Chris, Kristen said, you know, uh, the venues, if you get a package, they sort of make you get different times so that you can't get a package and say i want every saturday night at eight o'clock you can't the, the, the venue's not going to do that for you because they want to be fair to everyone involved but then again i believe all venues also probably have a la carte 
So then you can just, but it's gonna be a little more expensive. So think about that. It depends. I think that with venue choice, that's actually something to really consider. Ooh. Something to really consider is with venue, your venue is going to be different. Some venues stack show after show after show. So like John said, there is less flexibility um, and you have packages with dates that are already chosen that are already spread out. And then some show or some venues like book and then give you your dates. And uh, when the guide is about to come out in April, they start scheduling after they know how many shows they have um, in there. And then some venues are, are kind of like one off venues. Like Kristen has performed in some of these venues that are more like we do one or two shows. So there's a lot more flexibility there for people like in an immersive or things like that. Um, so I think just kind of running down that idea with your venue, figuring out what's gonna be best for you um, is gonna be the, the best choice because they're all gonna be different. And that's what's so awesome is that everything at Fringe is different. And that's what's so confusing for you as first, like as newer producers, but know that it's a, a blessing and a curse. Like there's so many great things that are about that flexibility and how literally every rule is meant to be broken and everything that we're saying here has been literally defied year after year. And also these are the successes that certain people have found. So uh, Layla, and then I do wanna to touch on something in just a second. I, I have to say um, your venue also wants to make you happy. So if you get a, it, they are not in the business of saying, Ugh, look at this like show breakdown. I'm gonna give them the weird time. No, they're they're being fair. They're mark they are catering to a lot of different artists and creatives. They're gonna make it as fair and best for you and work with you and they communicate with you as much as they can. And and you as a professional do that on your end as well. If you have a need that that's kind of their job to meet it. If you have like a date need. But with the, with the packaging, as a solo show, I was planning on three shows. And then as an ensemble, I went with five. I probably could have gone away, gotten away with three because it was a small ensemble. I had ensemble of seven. There's a great question in the chat that I'm gonna address really quickly. And then I'm gonna address another question in the chat from earlier. Um, grant money. If you're ser searching for grants, we'll talk a little bit about this later about fiscal sh sponsorship. You're gonna likely need fiscal sponsorship. There's options out there like Fractured Atlas is, an, is a uh, place where you can get um, like a fiscal sponsor so that you can apply for a 501c3 grants. Um, with grants, grant writing in general, I know this because I am a grant writer, um, you always want to pitch the maximum amount that you can actually viably um, have a budget for. So you aren't going to be irrational and turn someone off because then you, when you get the granted award and it comes out as a lot less than that, you have time in your contract to readjust what you're actually going to do. So I say that you always want to, when you're asking somebody for money, you always want to be like, it costs $50,000. That's exact. That is not reasonable for a friend show, but it costs $5,000. Um, is a reasonable thing. It costs five thousand dollars for all of the things I want, and when they come back with a thousand, you say, "For a thousand, I can do this, this, and this, and that. you know that kind of stuff." Or you're only going to pay for the venue, or you're only going to be able to pay for that part part of the thing, and that's very reasonable. Whenever you're doing um, a, uh, whenever you're doing a grant application, um, I do not know about fractured atlas costs. Sorry, guys. Um, I know that they're I just know that they're a, an option. Um, okay, really quickly, I want to touch on something uh, that is kind of hard for our community to talk about because we're not lawyers. We are not, um, we are not in, the, in the game of telling you what to do with this, but we are in the information sharing game. Um, with AB5, it is something that is difficult to, to sum up because everybody's situation is going to be very, very different. If you're just doing a fringe show, and then you're not going to be doing another production for a long time. Um, this is not really one that you have to worry too much about, but it's something that you want to be aware of and you should read into. If you're doing a theater company, uh, and you're, if you're in a theater company and you need to, um, and you're doing multiple shows in a year, you're doing multiple shows in a couple of years, um, this is something to, to consider. Um, AB5 was a law that passed in California about who is an independent contractor and who is an employee. And theater companies are not exempt from AB5 like musicians or other places. We are supposed to follow this law. 
Um, there is a link that's going into the chat with an article with a bunch of resources. Specifically, the one I want to point out is that there was a panel done by an amazing lawyer who just really dive, dove deep into what it meant to be a theater practitioner and follow this law. What it meant to be, have volunteers that are you're still paying a per diem for food or gas, how to do that legally. What it meant if you're going to pay people hourly and have them on as employees. These are things that you should look out into. It's going to differ based on what your professional needs are. Um, and if it's something that is starting to worry you, then maybe you should start to talk to other people in the community about how they're doing it. If anybody here wants to speak to that, you can. But basically what I would like to say is that um, there's kind of two options to do this. You can pay everybody as an employee or you can have volunteers. Those are the two main ways that people are deal dealing with AB5. You can skirt a lot of it by having volunteers. And that doesn't mean that you don't take care of your volunteers. Providing food, um, providing gas stipends, these sort of things are um, legal and there's ways to do that. There's In that document, there's ways that they show how to do that. Again, I'm not a lawyer. I wouldn't necessarily say that like, I know all the answers on how to do that legally, but there is that layout in there on, on that lawyer's advice on how to do that legally. So I would definitely look into that. See, make sure that you're kind of just aware of it. Um, and again, the, the main way that somebody is going to come after you for come after you for AB5 is if they file for unemployment. So if most people are, are unclear, basically the way that people could get in trouble is if people are mistakenly thinking that they were an employee of your company and they go and file for unemployment because they did your fringe show. So that's like mm. very a, a more rare thing that's going to happen, right? Um, so be aware of it. Look into this information that we have from the lawyer. If there's other things that come up, there's we'll share them. If there's other workshops or things that we see coming up, I know that there's a lot of, of theater companies that are talking about this right now. We'll make sure to share that on our social media if there's other uh, better information coming out about that as the theater companies in general kind of figure out how to deal with this. Um, does anybody have anything to add as far as AB5 or do we want to move on? I'll just second the, uh, that it's if you feel frustrated trying to figure out what AB5 is, that's totally normal. It's not you because it's very confusing. It's the same. It's it's a situation where like a new law has been put out and there's a lot of situations that have not been accounted for so like it's totally legit if you're trying to figure this out and you're like this doesn't make sense so don't get mad at yourself for that and um just try to do your research the best you can it is something to take seriously but it also is don't let it scare you off it can be handled but don't but take it seriously and, and do your research i think that's perfect it's like just like anything else it was passed in 2019 to go into effect in 2020, I believe, is when it went into effect. Great timing. Um, so it's also one of those things that I'm sure as we manage these next, at least reopening of our sector, there will just be a lot, in our sector being theater, there's going to be a lot more information because we still have a lot of closed down theater companies. We still have a lot of people who are trying to deal with COVID and this. Um, and we just don't have a lot of information yet. But the information we do have is inside there. And I also know that so many of our amazing uh, fringers are more familiar with this, do have other resources. So if you check in there and you have other resource, resources for us to add, email support at hollywoodfringe.org or if you have my email, email me and we'll add that to the to that um, post as well. But I highly recommend looking into that slideshow from the lawyer. It is like 60 to 70 slides of information um, of how it affects theater and how he sees a workaround. So I think that that would be great. Where did you say that is accessible, Ellen? In the chat, there's a um, support article. Oh, and then in that, we link to, it says, it. presentation by lawyer Mark Bookman, breaking down the relationship between AB5 and theater. Very that, that has a lot of information that I think breaks it down in an easier way than I've seen before. The other ones are like, how does that apply to me? And this one's like, this is how it applies to you. <laughs> um, so I would recommend that. I know John had said that there was a video series as well that we'll be adding into there as well. Okay, anything else? All right, friends, let's keep going. Um, my question for you guys, and I kind of want to go back to fundraising for just a second, and we'll take questions at the end, but feel free to drop things in the chat, friends, um, as we're going, but we're going to take live questions at the end so we can keep running through the questions that we have here. 
Um, so fundraising, people do crazy things. People do GoFundMe's these typical things. And then people have done things like, I remember I had somebody on a panel and it made me so surprised. Sophie Khan from 2018 was like, I, I, I bought the back page out of the fringe guide. And then I sold half of this, half of it to this restaurant and half of it to that restaurant. And then I had a free gu guide ad. Like people do things that are like quirky and um, interesting ways to save money on fringe. Where do you typically save in your, in your budget? Like, what are the things that you're like, I have a friend that does this for me. So I don't have any designers um, that, that do my graphic design. I know Kristen, you probably do that yourself, right? Where do you save and where do you spend in your budget? Wherever possible. <laughs> I mean, for me, it depends on the show. Like there's different, every show has different needs, especially with the kind of stuff I do. And so, yeah, but wherever you have, I mean, you know, you ask a lot of favors as a producer, you, you, you ask a lot of favors. So um, you, I think part of being a producer is you kind of have to not be scared to ask for favors. And, but also that being said, in, in Fringe, know that there's a lot that goes back to the whole be ready to give your tickets away thing. Because you can be very quick to give people tickets for the, for things. If they have another show, cross, this is going into marketing, but like cross marketing with other shows. Like there's, so there's ways you can say, hey, if you can help me out with this, I can help you out with this too and, and and that sort of thing so but that's the kind of going into another another conversation but um definitely explore your resources and and who you know that um that has what skills and, and can help you out in what in what ways and any skills you have you're going to use them <laughs> and you're going to learn new skills because you have to <laughs> i gotta say you know we don't want to get into the marketing stuff but I think marketing is a place to be very cognizant of what you're spending. I think someone in the chat mentioned, you know, are there cheap venues? And I think that we can talk about those options of money saving rehearsal space or um, money saving venues in a moment. But to the question, I have found every time I've produced that location eats more of my budget than I want. So you might wanna be mentally prepared for that. That location unfortunately takes more of my budget than I want it to. And then uh, secondly, with marketing, that's a place like the comp swap situation. Networking is actually a really big place where you can save money. I happened to uh, last year be part of the LA play, oh God, I said it wrong. LA Women Playwrights, LA WP. LAFPI. LAFPI, sorry. <laughs> there we are. Fe so if you are female identifying, um, then this is a group where we got together to Zoom support each other. And this was a, a group of people that we really did do comp swamps. A lot of people promoted the heck out of each other. And especially if you are a solo show, you, you are required to do all the, the networking for yourself. If you are leading an ensemble show, I don't think you should expect your actors to do it because they might not. You just need to be prepared that not every actor is gonna be selling your tickets for you. And it's not necessarily their job, to be fair. It's not really their job. It's your job. <laughs> so um, it, is, it is your job. Um, but these spaces, going to the gap, like going and networking on Gather, you, if you are someone who are, you know, have problems with accessibility of being able to get to an in-person event, there are still virtual events. Whatever you can physically be at, that's minus gas money, that is free marketing. That is a place you can save money. The more that people hear your the name of your show, the more likely they will go to your show. Or at least they'll be like, oh yeah, I heard about that one. And they, you know, just hearing about it makes someone assume it's good. I don't know why, but I worked with it. It worked, really helped me, served me very well. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I think that there are ways that marketing can save money if you are thinking about it as if I physically show up for somebody, that kind of transactional, how can they show up for you? This is where I kind of talk about when you're budgeting your time, like, is it something that you can outsource monetarily because you can afford it if it's causing too much stress? I think that John has really emphasized that point. And I'm sure Kristen has felt that point very deeply. <laughs> Yes, and uh, what is worth saving you stress? Um, and, and talking about marketing, money, one has to decide. We can go discussion. Do you want to hire one of the press agents for the fringe? That that's gonna that's a line item. 
okay? Um, it, again, this, this is kind of a stress reliever because, you know, you could probably send out your stuff to people, but is it worth, I'm just gonna, $500 to have someone do all that work for you um, and has a better relationship with the reviewers and so forth and possibly help you that way? Do not buy 5,000 postcards. Okay, you, do, you just don't need 5,000. So think about how many postcards you need, you know, maybe a couple thousand. You know, I know that you get them in batches. Um, this was the best marketing. And I wear it all the time because I bought extra. And it's my t-shirt for my show. That was the first thing I got done as soon as I knew my dates. I had t-shirts made for the cast, everyone. I, I wore it all the time. I walk into the plunge. I walk into a bar. I am my advertisement. I was always fascinated. Now, I don't want to give it away how few t-shirts I saw on people. It is a walking billboard. Okay. It's not that expensive. This is all cotton. It's okay. And I, I highly recommend. Now, of course, I'm going to say this and everyone's going to have a t-shirt at Fringe, but I think that it is, it is better than a postcard. People don't, when you hand them a postcard, do, okay, do not get a five by seven postcard. Don't think the bigger my postcard, the better it's going to be. It's not going to fit on the stand. No one's going to want to hold it in their hand. Maybe get a little business card that they stick in their pocket. And uh, yes, it's a, prid, a quid pro quo, a lot of marketing with people. Um, it, uh, I will not tell you yes or no. Yes, you can buy an ad in the Fringe Guide. But, <laughs> but you have to decide if you think that's going to be. You can, uh, something also I did a lot is my work is very visual. I had, I would every several days, I would have another video, a 15 second, 30 second video of a rehearsal, of a moment, of a thing, da, da, da. but my work is visual. I highly recommend video as a venue on social media. Putting a picture only goes so far, but if someone's like, look at that movement, look at that choreography, look at this moment, look at what they're doing. That's, that I think is highly effective and it's free. And, sure. the, and, and also to continue, uh, you know, to keep having, uh, you know, I'm, I, I already have a dozen marketing things ready yeah you know you, you have to and again i it, i'm a one-man band sort of thing and i'm used to doing it that could be overwhelming but maybe you're like you have a friend you say i need you to do my social media every week i need a video i need something you got it i'm always surprised how i don't see as much of that in our social media could I, could we all speak, keep speaking to marketing? And I have one more follow-up question for John and then uh, keep, keep the, keep your thoughts, uh, Kristen and Layla. I know that you both have them. Um, I just really wanted to ask, do you budget a lot towards marketing or do you rely more on these like free marketing things that are going to uplift your show more? I, from last time to this time, I brought that down. There's a few things, uh, they who shall not be named. There's a few things I'm choosing not to do because I didn't think that $300, I don't think that was, it, it wasn't needed. Uh, you know, there's a, it's honestly, I think all of the, the three of us can say the biggest marketing is physically being a human being, walking around the fringe. Talk, I know, even though we're performers, many people have anxiety with just talking to somebody. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, just FYI, you ask someone about their show, you won't be able to walk away. Okay? I know better. And have, have, better have a tagline, have, have the elevator pitch. That really is, that's, that's very important. Because if you, if someone says, hey, what's your show? And you start to ramble, bu, 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 have a sentence. It's a one woman show about a woman who goes to San Francisco, becomes a prostitute and a gangster. Wow. You, you got it. You got to be prepared with that. You got to give that to your cast. Tell them that's what I want you to say. And talking what Layla said, 
it's not their job. And every year I will do this and I'll talk to other people. I can't believe my cast. They are not promoting. They never sweat anything. B- get used to it. You're going to feel that way. You, okay. you will. They'll still be mad that they didn't promote, but it is not their job. But your show will be a hit and they'll be like, look at us. And I'm like, you did nothing. Okay. <laughs> so do not expect, and, and you cannot get upset. It's, it's your baby. Listen, it's your baby. They're Kristen. there. So Kristen has a burning question. So I'm no, gonna... no, I'm, no, I yeah. just want to, just, I just have a million things I could say about this. Do you, do you want us to go a little more into the marketing stuff? Is this yeah. on track? Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, everything John said is completely on, on point. Um, I like, as far as getting cast involved, um, like outside of fringe, it's absolutely not their job. I do. When I cast for fringe, I let them know off the bat that, that they will be scheduled to make appearances at social events. Like it is a part of that. And I do, I literally, if for a bigger show, you are, so it totally depends on your show, what your marketing plan is, right? But if you're lucky, your show will have something that has fabulous characters or costumes or a a gimmicky thing or something that that you can go and do at all of the events right so assuming and that's a a bigger conversation but assuming that that's the case i literally put out a marketing schedule for my cast and they are scheduled to make appearances at all the events we do office hours but i also have huge casts and it's and and this is not just for immersive i've done the same thing back through big musicals and everything having your cast there and the more like i think you said before layla right that you've seen two cents people at events she's like i've seen i was just gonna say that that we have never met but i have always seen a two cents person when i'm (laughs) that's great because it because absolutely what what everyone's been saying being there in person is a hundred percent the way to have a successful friend show. Um, and a lot of people, most of us, most of us artists hate this, right? We don't like networking and marketing ourselves. It's not what we enjoy doing. Fringe is a really, really welcoming and warm, wonderful place to figure out how to do that and become comfortable. I always call it networking for dummies because you walk into If you're outside of Fringe, you got to go promote your show. You're like, oh, who do I, who do I tell? Hey, can I tell you about my show? Well, no one wants to listen, right? At Fringe, you walk into an office hours and you have everyone comes up to you. Hey, are you doing a show? What's your show? Can you tell me about it? I want to, can I tell you about my show? Can I give you tickets? Can I, how do I get tickets to your show? So it's like, a, it's really like, it really opens a, a wide open door for you to go in it and th- get, become comfortable talking about your show. Um, that being said, also what John was saying, be prepared for it. Um, you want to have a really good elevator pitch. You want to know how you're pitching your show. And that can totally be different depending on what kind of show you are. If you're doing immersive stuff, it's a whole nother, a whole nother ball game of, of like this encryptive marketing that, that you do. Um, but whatever your show is, you want to, you got to find a way to make it stand out. Not just, oh yeah, I'm, I, it's the show I've been working on for a while and um, in it I kind of do this or like, I don't, you know, like that's not, you got to come in and say, oh, well in this show, this is what's going to happen to you. This is the, like whatever your pitch might be, but you got to have a really sharp because people are bouncing around, talking, talking. You're not going to have seven minutes to talk someone's ear off about your show. You want to have a quick under a minute pitch. This is what it is th- that they're going to remember. And when they go home that night, they're like, oh, that one show that was really different. I want to check that out. Let me get that postcard and put it put it aside here. Um, and if you have a big cast and you're sending your cast to do marketing, I spend an entire like rehearsal section on marketing, on like figuring out, especially for something like immersive, where you literally in immersive we literally rehearse our marketing pitch because it's a whole another show, <laughs> the marketing part of it. They they there are uh, cabarets. I don't. They're, 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 it's not all specifically if you're a musical. I mean, if you're a musical and you got your music ready, uh, uh, you know, there's cabaret venues. You can go do a moment of your show. Uh, There's the Fringe Cabaret, which you just literally email and they will get you on the slate. It can be doing a scene from the show. It can be doing a funny bit in character. If you're worried about, maybe if you have a drama and you wanna, if you wanna have, if you have a drama, I'm a comedy person myself. If you have a drama, you wanna rope somebody in and do a scene, good for you. But you, you don't have to like be committed to like the most gut-wrenching, this is my liver on the page part of your show. You can even do something that's a little offbeat and just make people interested in you. Mm-hmm. you know, and, I mean, that's part of networking as well. As much as you want the elevator pitch, I almost feel like my networking experiences, we do our elevator pitches 
it's probably someone I'm going to see again. So as soon as that's out of the way, I'm so much more invested in seeing somebody where we talked about the best place to get Korean barbecue. Mm -hmm. And like, and make don't them. feel pressure to only talk about that. And you can also give each other tips and like, where is that? Be, be, be on it. <laughs> I like Ace Gogi and Van Nuys. <laughs> Uh, but <laughs> yeah, it's so good. They have this weird, I can go on. Sorry. Um, <laughs> and make, and make sure I'm a very big foodie. Uh, but I, I'll also say it can even be some place I'm, I'm a, I think a lot of people in this room are probably perfectionists at heart, or I don't want to share my craft until it's ready. That is not this space. Hey, I am panicking. I can't get anyone to buy a ticket. Anybody else having this problem? You know, Hey, I can't figure out, am I supposed to do a dramatic lighting thing? What have you done? Like, it is a place you can also get advice. You don't have to have all the answers. It's okay something, to be a mild mess. And Not something to remember important because some people, it, their brain doesn't work that way. Make sure that when you meet someone, don't leave the situation and have that person go, they never asked one thing about Hi, me. I'm Layla. Yeah. Totally. If, if, if I can sort of actually loop this back into the, or the, the money, how do you save money with this question? It's totally about what is going to be the worthwhile, like we've all said, worthwhile cost for your show. Um, if you are a show that has great gimmicky stuff, it's definitely spend the money on getting those items. People love to get stuff at Fringe. I highly recommend having things you can hand to people. Buttons. People love yeah. buttons. I do buttons for every show in whatever way, whether it's like an actual character button, like vote for me when you come to, you know, or if it's just a show marketing button, but people love buttons. I consider that a very worthwhile cost. Um, and so, yeah, so definitely put your money into physical things. I think that physical things are very, very good at Fringe because people take them and have them and they see them again. Um, on the flip side of that, though, I also think the website impressions are, are a good worthwhile spend as well because it's just, um, like I've said, there's hundreds of shows at the Fringe. The absolute most important thing is getting people to remember what your show is because you might have the most amazing blurb in the guide ever, but most people aren't. I don't think really reading through those to find interesting sounding shows because there's already so much to captivate interest. So that's so you got to find a way beyond just your your guide and your page to get people to notice you. I remember sh solo shows from years back that were like what was the girl who was a giant condom at every like right? What was, I don't even remember what the show is, but I remember her. She was I giant penis. She was a giant penis. Her, her laundry every... was balls on. Yes. 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 Her, her show was balls, balls on. It was her. And then there was John in his ridiculous superhero costume that he would in all the time. And like, so not you, John, John pa Patrick. Yes. Pa yeah. Um, so, you know, so like, I, you remember those, <laughs> they stick out in your brain. And that's, that will get people, the, your show will be sold out if everyone in Fringe remembers you from those scenarios. I think Layla, like, really quick, and then I will have something to add. Uh, I just, if it's about in person, I was going a different direction. Did you want to add first? Um, I, if it's about marketing, go ahead. Okay. I think that we're kind of also missing another easy free thing. If I were, if I had my show together right now, it is free to make my Zoom background right now my show, which I started doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's good idea. Like, just saying, tribe, these are the performance dates. Like, tribe, the first all Arab American mm -hmm. improv show, like these are the performance dates and the website. Like, you know, like it is easy. That is free. I actually also, in light of COVID, I know it was it was very, very odd to be producing last year. And um the staff and the, the festival do a very good job of, of keeping you up to date. So don't let that hold you back. I did feel like things were updated as much as they could be when they could be. And it was very much prepare for it could go this way or that way, just so you know. And so please do feel secure as a producer that that information gets to you very immediately, as long as you're someone who promptly checks your emails. Um, and I, but like, I didn't do postcards. I, I know we mentioned postcards. The postcard, I remember whenever I first participated as an actor, um, the postcard is king. Like, I mean, everyone remember, everyone has those that they remember. Just like you remember the person in person that wore a condom. You also remember some of the most exquisite postcards you've ever seen. And some of them are just like a really good picture design as, and then put out there. But like the design has to be key if you're not doing like 
my friend did a wax seal on her Dracula immersive show and it was very intense and the show was very intense and it was excellent and it was all on brand. It was all great. Um, but I only printed out enough postcards last year to be at my venue if somebody was at my venue and they could pick it up. I didn't print out that many because I was like, people don't want to touch things right now. I think that shifted. So please don't take that with a huge, please take that advice with a grain of salt. Um, but also if, if you're noticing people um, not wanting to touch things, I think that's, we're hopefully over that hump of this situation. <laughs> please consider the um, everything. Olive oil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Go ahead, Alan. <laughs> yeah, no, no problem. Um, I I think I do think that QR codes are gonna be key still this year. I think that that's a good thing to bring up um, because QR codes help with that. When somebody's like, I don't want to take a card, but I want the information, bring them to your project page immediately. Um, look at that little puppy, Olive. Um, okay, so quickly before we open this up to questions, because I I feel that there's a lot of burning things. We're talking a lot about branding. I love it. We're talking a lot about branding and how important that is. We're talking a lot about how that builds into your marketing plan. Can we talk really quick about defining your artistic and uh, production goals? Because I think that that's the first step for some of the for some of our new fringers is figuring out what your goal is. How did you like think back to the first time you did fringe and what that goal was? Um, and how did you like start to create that goal? And how do you start to reset that goal every year? And how does that influence how, where you spend, what you do? Um, I'm, an, I'm an actor writer. <laughs> Vanity Project, it was supposed to be a Vanity Project. As I went into the writer actor with my ensemble show, of this is my writing, I wanna get out there. It is still a Vanity Project. It's that I want a documented record. So, so for the solo show, it's that I wanna be able to tell this very personal story for me. For the um for the ensemble show that i wrote it's that i have hit a wall of how to maybe sell this script but hey maybe somebody will watch it cool and it ended up being an accidental theater um like experiment of a half improv half theater show so i did i like to call it the hybrid of the hybrid so it was very i don't know niche works right find your niche i think that was in the thing really find your niche. It'll really help you sell yourself, um, which is what all this is. Mm -hmm. But I, I just knew I wanted eyes on it. So my goal for the first time was that I want to be able to market that, hey, I've done this to maybe garner representation. That's a goal that a lot of people have. It's very valid. And I think my goal last year was 100%. Yeah, I, I, I want to be able to grab blurbs and quotes from people. I want people to be inspired to drop a review after seeing this show. So I need eyes on it. What was your artistic and production goals, John? Because I think they're a little different, but do you did you have any goals when putting up your show? Um, the, I mean, I produced a lot. I mean, I create my own work and I have a very specific style of work and I, I use live percussion and it's movement and uh, I, I did many shows back in New York and it had been a long time after I moved here that I actually mounted my own production and I was ready. And for me, I don't, I, and I said this to people, I didn't think I was mounting a fringe show. I was mounting a show. Okay. Because I think sometimes that diminishes. Oh, you're a fringe show. You're just going to have like, you know, it's going to be rinky dink and we're, we're throw it together. Some people do. I looked at it and, and, and it was a big, and, and, and I got a lot of comments from people. They said, wow, that looked like a fully produced show. Now that's me. That's what I wanted to do. Money, I don't want, listen, I don't want to say I'm, uh, money is no, whatever the cost. It kind of was, I ended up, you know, we can, you know, you can ask me, I don't mind sharing my numbers, but I'm coming down a little bit to see where I can save. Um, but my goal was just to show my art to the world and to ultimately 
uh, you know, I, I want to go to New York and produce my show. So this is a way, as Layla said, you get a lot of good reviews. You get a lot of good pull quotes. You, you have a reputation. So, you know, this year with Housewife, it's, uh, I, I literally, I had the, I, we closed in 2019, July 1st. I think by the end of July, I already had this idea. And I just, and you know, we as artists, we just, once you do it, oh, I got to do it again. And, and you just got to do it. And so for this year, you know, it's expanded. It was four songs. Now it's seven songs. This is now considered a musical. So my artistic, you know, goal again is just is, is to promote a show, amount a show that uh, I could easily surprise the actors and go, oh, FYI, we're going to go to New York and do it. So that that's what I want to do. Kristen, do you have any other different goals that you had in mind when producing at the first time that you did Frames or even I then? don't know. <laughs> I don't know the answer to this question. <laughs> I have no idea. I'm good. I'm different because I've been running this company. So it's it's for your, it's all often, it's not, it's for the goals of the company. And like, like when we first started Fringe, we realized, oh, we need to do Fringe. And so we, you know, found a show we thought was going to be a huge hit at Fringe, but it was a complete wrong show to pick for Fringe because it was very non-marketable. It was, I, it was brilliant and wonderful and very powerful musical, but like impossible to market. There was no niche stuff to sell. We did full body mics and a full band. It was like really, yeah, a few fugitive songs. Do you remember? Do you remember? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't, it was, it was great and it was very well received, but anyway, so but we picked it saying, oh, we want to be involved with Fringe. And the next year we said, oh, well, now we get it. Now we know what we should do for Fringe. So we wrote Nilbog, the musical parody of Troll 2. And that was our second Fringe show, which is, could not be more different from Fugitive Songs. And we went the full spectrum of like fringiness on that one. But those early years were definitely like, we want to be, you know, we want to be known in the Fringe world. We want to make it, figure out how to get into that, into the into the Fringe game. And, and now we've kind of, you know, found what we're really good at and do the immersive stuff and kind of have let the other things go. But we also do like, I have a, a, a festival that my company produces in the spring called Acting on Ink Fest. And so we've done now for several years, I think for three or four years, we've done a best of ink at Fringe. So we also always have a production where we've taken a show from the festival and we're remounting that in a bigger scenario at, at the Fringe. So that's, for that is our own goal there where we're, we kind of use Fringe to like sort of be an extra marketing boost for Inkfest, but also be like a great, um, a, you know, reward for the the selected pieces to continue on. So, so different different goals for different things. Gatsby we're doing because we want it to be we're going to do Gatsby over nine chapters. So <laughs> we want to like uh, so, but so we were like let's start it at Fringe to start the buzz. Like not every chapter will be at Fringe because God, this thing can't take nine years. So, but the ones, but we wanted to start it there to kind of help give us a little, you know. So yeah, depends on the show. Go ahead, I think Layla. something interesting that like all of our answers, just just to draw this line for everyone sitting in the hot seats, um, all of our answers are still honoring like our artistic desires. Kristen is part of an ensemble. What their team has put forth with Two Cents has continued, even if it's refined what the technical story is. John has done the same with his shows as he keeps on progressing and getting his work out there. Um, you know, for, for my work, um, my work is, it's very important to me to be like an Arab American voice. So whenever I pivoted, it was still an Arab American mm -hmm. comedy. It was still that same kind of voice and figuring out how does that fit. Doing a, a theater experiment is a great thing to do at Fringe. And it worked. So that was a surprise. That was nice. But yes, Kristen. <laughs> I do. I just want to add too, like I didn't mention, you know, about anything on the long lines of a, of a small passion project. And like, there's absolutely, it's a wonderful place too, to take, if you want to see if your show can just, is, is a hit and take off. I, a show that I didn't, it's not my creation, but I produced a show called The Day I Became Black that was in, 2018 I think or 2019 and um what did not did not did not win best solo show I now my now boyfriend won it instead which is very ironic but we have now but it was a hugely successful French production I was 
insanely turning away people and packing that smaller Broadwater space like every time. And we're now we've been we did a couple off Broadway runs. Thanks, Matt Quinn's in the audience. He helped us get there. And we've now we were in off we were at the Soho Playhouse for months. Uh, for a very long run um, after Fringe, we've done multiple runs all over, and we're we, we're working with producers to hopefully get it onto Netflix or HBO right now. We just shot a sizzle reel this summer, and so so that that's a possibility. It's totally a thing that can happen, and it's a good place. Fringe is a great place to start. It's a good place to start a show. I love a success story. It's true. There are a lot of people who have brought their productions from Fringe to, to film. Matthew Robinson is another person who could speak to that if anybody's interested. Um, like there's been a lot of people who have found that success and I think it's exciting to hear. Um, uh, Chatter as well, yeah. Chatter, Natasha Lewin's show in 2018 was a scholarship winner and then she turned it into a short film and then it was up for a Golden Globe, I can't remember. Something something like insane where you're like, what? Yeah, we, won, <laughs> um, we won the off, uh, an Off-Broadway Alliance Award when we were out in New York for best solo performance. Yeah, so it, it can garner that response. So I think you have to define what your goal is. And I think that that's what we've been talking about so much during this panel. Is your goal reviews? Is your goal agent seeing it is your goal just getting your passion project off the ground is it all of the above pick a couple of goals see if you can meet them and also look into shows that have met that goal before like kristen is saying with the day i became black or chatter or these things what did they do to get there some of them just were in the right place at the right time and some of them had like very determined goals um and i think speaking to people at office hours about their experiences will be really key speaking, uh, coming to these panels, listening to past panels, all of our panels are online from the past, you can watch them. Everybody has a different goal, everybody had a different perspective, and everybody that we bring on has had a life after Fringe or has had great success, you know? Okay, we have 30 minutes, and I know that there's probably some burning Q&A, so I'm gonna move into q and I have a couple questions in my pocket if nobody else has questions, but if you have a question, this is the way to do it. Um, you're gonna raise your hand virtually or throw in the chat, I have a question. Um, when you are there, you're, we're going to pin you into this. You're going to unmute, you're gonna say your name, you're gonna say your show, um, so that you can start getting that into people's minds and then ask your question and then you'll be unpinned. But it's a great way to start that marketing is to get people to think about your show. Go ahead, Kristen. Um, just there was a question in the chat earlier I was gonna address, but I haven't had the moment. Should I now or are we past that? Go ahead. Okay, <laughs> someone had asked us to touch briefly on outdoor venues, um, which which is very much my uh, world. So I just wanted to, and it kind of also goes into how to how to save, because um, it can be a little deceiving on whether or not it's theater or non-theater is more expensive. And I've done a lot of non-theater venues. Um, and so I think what, what to look at in those non-theater venues, you definitely can, I mean, theaters are very cheap for French. Like those rates you're seeing are great Right. So when you're asking other cheap spaces for Fringe, the answer is yes, all of them. They are all much cheaper than any venue you're going to get outside of the Fringe. But that being said, if you're still trying to find the absolute, you know, and you're like, oh, it must be cheaper to be in a park, right? Um, the answer is it totally can be. If you're dealing with, if you're dealing with, like we've done, we did stuff at the elementary school at, at Vine Street. So we've done, and we we almost did a park last year and ended up not. Um, but so we've done, those are all city, con they're all city contracts, right? So you have to do city paperwork. They're pretty easy to get as long, you just got to do the your due diligence and the paperwork the per the difference between a, a non theater space and a theater space is often going to be that non performance time your your per performance rate is often going to be significantly cheaper at a non theater venue because they're only charging you per hour they don't care that you're doing a show or a rehearsal or what you're doing it's just an hourly rate so you might be like at the school i think we we're paying $25 an hour or something like that always so that's even in performance times, that's what we were paying. But where you gotta be careful is then all your other time because then your, t your rehearsal and your tech ends up being much more expensive than it would be at a different space because you're not getting free rehearsal, you're not getting any of that included. So I think you really can cut costs by using non-traditional venues um, but be in the performance aspect of it, but know that it's not gonna necessarily help you out with rehearsals and things like that. And so for that world, you still wanna plan on being at your apartment. But also that being said, don't not to be confused with outdoor rehearsals are wonderful, not in your performance space. Like if you're renting a park or renting a school or doing something like that, those hourly costs are gonna be expensive. But I have 
especially if you're doing a show that's outdoor and non-conventional anyway, I have rehearsed all over the streets of theater row. <laughs> we rehearsed in like, we rehearsed in the broom closet at the Hudson. No joke. They looked at me like I was nuts when I walked and asked for that one day. We rehearsed in, we one day, I don't know if I encourage, should be encouraging this, but we literally needed a place to, to pitch a tent for Unreal City to figure out where to pitch this tent to practice, the, rehearse the uh, tent scene. And we were walking up and down Hudson Avenue and one of our actors started knocking on doors. And some guy was like, sure, you can put it in my driveway. And we pitched a tent on the driveway and rehearsed there. So outdoor, exploring your, your possibilities for outdoors rehearsals are huge for, for potentially cutting costs if it works for your show. It's not going to work for everybody. Oh, yeah. oh, sorry. You can go ahead. Jim. Well, I was going to say, I used to do in New York, I did many shows out in Washington Square Park for many years. Mm -hmm. um, I, I love outdoor performing. The, you know, and also to think, and I don't know if Kristen touched on it, 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 if it's during the day, okay, what happens when it's night? Yeah. Do you have a light source? We used to use high powered mag flashlights to light the other actors. Um, the, the sound, is it gonna be immersive where people are kind of like up with you, just chatting with you? Is it gonna be presentational? You better get some actors who know how to utilize their voices. Um, you're going to be dealing with the sound of Hollywood around you. Um, you know, so there's all, there's just the technical aspect, which, you know, I'm sure Kristen knows all about of actually performing <laughs> physically if, outside. Too. Yeah. If you're doing like a more traditional show instead of an immersive where Kristen's talking about, those are venues selected to enhance your performance experience. LA is noisy. And like LA is very noisy outside. So it can even be noisy in your apartment if you were doing like a live stream from your apartment. Um, but like, other than considering lighting, like, do you know, is this gonna be a noise? Like go with your ears anytime if you're looking at a performance sure. space. Um, we rehearsed in parks without a permit because we didn't mind other people being there. You don't necessarily have to have a permit for that. I will say um, just if you're not, if you're doing a Sunday matinee, maybe it works, but what if, you know, somebody's having a birthday party? <clears throat> well, like, where no, you it, clear it's very much on whether, sorry. Yeah. It's very much on whether or not it's right. It's right for your show. It definitely doesn't work for everything for, you know, more, it depends on the tone of your show and all that for immersive. It's excellent because you want your actors to be ready to be in the middle of chaos. And so it's, it's great for that. Um, I, I just want yeah. to cut this question off just because, Sorry, I, yeah. yeah, and I, we have some other Go ones. On. One, one thing I want to name from the fringe perspective, um, it is illegal to busk in LA. Um, there are some, some things, so just listen to people when they tell you to move along. I think that that would be the, the suggestion I have for people who said, oh, uh, on a street corner or things like that. Typical. Lots of people are re reading lines on the street together before their fringe performance. If somebody comes and says, hey, do you mind moving this along? You need to go go um, so that you don't get in trouble. Um, yeah. But I think that that's kind of the perspective with a lot of things, mm -hmm. right? Is just follow things as best as you can. Um, it's fringe, things are gonna be crazy. You might be rehearsing in a broom closet or in the parking lot of your theater as you're waiting for the show to happen and you change the line and you're going over it. Um, so those are the suggestions. Um, a lot of our theater spaces offer discounted rates like Lois said in the chat. Um, if you're booked there for a rehearsal in their space, if you need those like dress rehearsal moments, most people um, typically rehearse in their houses. If somebody in your cast has a big backyard or somebody in your cast has a sizable living room or a studio apartment with enough space for you guys to um, put, up the, put up the couch, make sure that push everything to the walls and you have a space, people do that a lot. So the parking hole, the parking hole we rehearse all the time, just not after dark. And just know that you know that it's ragtag and that's okay. Like that is French. Ragtag is allowable. And, um, you know, some people haven't set the one thing I would say is like, make sure that you're not at your tech, not rehearsed. If I can just say one more thing about if you are using a public space, I really feel passionately what your job as a producer is, is to make everyone feel safe at all times. Yes. So be very aware that safety is first if you're doing this choice that includes i i think it's your responsibility as producer to make sure everyone feels comfortable getting to their car everyone feels comfortable blah 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 so so, so be thoughtful of is something sketchy it's just really not worth it 
Safety and fringe is also paramount. And if you need somebody, if you feel uncomfortable at any times when you're in a fringe space, say you're at like our closing party or opening party office hours, we will walk you to your car. We do have a protocol for that so that you, if you're alone promoting yourself, um, you don't have to be alone walking to your car. Fringe staffers will typically go in two with you and we'll walk you to your car and then we'll come back to the space that we're, that we're managing at that point. And I know a lot of um, producers are kind like that too. So watch out for each other, take care of each other. I want to get to the, the other questions. Um, so, so I'm going to go to that, but then if we have more time, I want to hear these other thoughts because you guys are amazing and I could talk to you for three <laughs> to four hours. Um, I really could, but um, I see that there's some hands up and so I want to get to those questions. Um, Lori, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Hi. Thank you everyone for this generosity of like brain just brain information so my question is um you know usually with budgets i come from like a film school background where we will put like a percentage so it's like i had to do everything myself last year but if i wanted to pay like a producer in fringe uh like i keep 20 percent for the venue costs is there a general percentage that a producer like of Kristen's caliber would be like, yeah, that's okay. Um, like, or Layla, like, you know, or John could like, is there a percentage that would be 10%, 15%, 20%? It doesn't have to be right. If I leave without the right answer, nothing's going to happen. Um, and then my second question is on Kickstarter last year, I offered all these rewards and the rewards cost like thousands. <laughs> so any suggestions on like freebie, uh, freebie rewards and what I can pay a producer of one of you three's caliber to make my experience a little more pleasant. Kristen, I think you could speak to that first, right? Yeah, I've always, um, when I've been a hired producer at Fringe, it's always been a flat rate. Um, I think that percentages are tricky at, at, for any, gr any green, pro anyone who's not super experienced and can really show that they're going to have a solid return to take. I think it's going to be hard to get someone to, to, to do it based on percentage. Um, but I, so I think a flat rate is more... Um, probably that's how I feel. I don't know how other, other people feel, but I think a flat rate is a better. Um, and I've had different rates for different shows. Like the show I mentioned the day it became black, he paid me very well because he spends money. And that's part of how he got to where he is, is he's put the money into that show. Um, but then when I've, when other people have approached me, I, I've, I've taken it much less, but I mean, I, I think for fringe, should we put actual numbers out there? I think, yeah, I think you it, can it help. Well, so we have to be super careful about things. Yes. <laughs> like the legal standing lawyer. So oh. let me just really quickly give some guidelines. Oh. Um, so um, <laughs> you can do ranges. We can talk ranges. We can talk about, you can reference certain budgets or things like that. Um, and I think that's fine. Can I clarify with Macy? When you were talking, I, I, I was understanding when you said percent that how much percent of your total budget should go to the producer or were you talking take a percentage of the box office no the percentage like if i have a budget of five thousand for my five oh, I, mis I misunderstood i was thinking you were meant box office yeah oh okay so 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 maybe we could just expand well, the question to what what's a what's a percentage to pay like on the q lab i learned last year a going rate is like uh offer people uh some people do it for 25 percent of their normal big time rate so on um, producers is the i never met any producers last year because of covid i think we one thing i want to name too is that there's a lot of producers that will charge a lot of different things and so i think saying like don't like i think doing a percentage of a budget is a really great idea because i think that that is going to be a more accurate thing um than saying like this is how much for this show this is how much i also think that when it comes to people's rates they will change based on the person and you just have to shop around and you need to talk to a couple of people see what the benefit is and usually when you find the right person you know in your in your heart that they're the right person for your production and then you can work that into your budget because you know that's the person you want you know but go ahead chris and layla if you guys have things to say 
I, um, if you don't mind, I think you just need to be very clear of what the producer's providing. Back whenever I was flying with the solo show, I was like, ooh, if it's only me, that's a lot of work for me to do by myself. And so I looked at the producer route and I was like, you know, I think that I have the time available to donate to this. I remember us meeting during Fringe last year. So I think you have a very clear idea what you need your producer to do. So I would make a list of, as my producer, I would need you to, you know, is it go to X number of networking events as well as, as well as handle press, as well as do what it is, but have that itemized list for your producer so they can give you an accurate rate that's not going to make you upset with the money you spent on them. And, and I also think to you remember could... that what you're asking of a producer for Fringe is quite different than what you'd ask a producer to mount a full production for eight weeks. Yeah. It's two different things. Cause a lot, a lot of stuff is, you know, kind of taken care of. Uh, so is it really, do you need a person for emotional support? Do you need that person, you know, just to, 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 to handle the busy work of getting the marketing, talking to your press agent, maybe going to events while you're rehearsing? So that's where you, and again, as we all said, it's, I assume you can find this wide range, but talk to people first and talk to us so you don't get duped. Alternatively, that happened, is it yeah, that happened to me last year in, in a category. That's why I'm like, hey, what's normal? Like, are you guys, like our producers at your caliber, like, okay, like I'm 500 for, the, for a solo show, like in a black box. You know, is it like 500, 1,000, 1,500 and a percentage of the box office? Like if I just know what the reasonable lowest to high, then I have something to reference so people don't take advantage of me. I'll, I'll say, I, I think a good, I think the trouble with the percentage with fringe is, is like, like John was, it depends on what you're wanting from them, right? When I've been a hired producer, like when I'm my own producer, it do. Absolutely, way, way, way more than when I'm a hired producer. Usually when I've been a hired producer, I'm not creatively involved in the development of the show. That's been its own thing that's being taken care of. And I've been hired to put the show up at Fringe. So I'm doing all of the Fringe stuff. I'm, you know, getting us in the in the guide. I'm getting, I'm teaching the person how to do all their marketing, how to, everything that I'm like talking about here, I'm teaching that part and like walking them through it and, and helping them to get butts in the seats and like figure out all the, help them to sign up for awards, get press to their show, like all that kind of stuff. So it doesn't really matter to me what the budget of that show is. I'm doing the same thing, whether it's a musical or a solo show. So I think that's where a percentage gets a little tricky for what, at least what I usually do as a hired person, hey guys. If, that, if that makes sense. Uh, I gotta ask, I gotta, we have 10 minutes left and there's other questions. <laughs> we can move on. Here's my final bit of advice. I loved the idea of breaking down what, how many hours are gonna be required. What are you expecting your producer to do? What, and then coming back at that with that producer's expectation, then you can really see if you're, what the hourly rate would be. Cause then if you're breaking down that flat fee to that hourly rate, you're able to see, yeah, they're getting paid appropriately. Um, and so yes. I think that's, I think you can ask and I think you can negotiate. And I think that that's gonna be a personal thing for what you need. And I think that we can't speak to it any more than that other than start oh, to- listen, it's it. fine, it's fine. Like at least this is a touchstone because yeah. we're talking about budgeting. So I wanna make a budget that's realistic. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, totally. All right, I totally get it. And I think we gotta move on. Um, and thank you so much. It was a great question. Um, I'm gonna ask Isabel, I saw that your hand was up if you want to unmute and ask your question. Uh, yeah, so uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, um, so I did put it in the chat, so I know we're gonna get something in the packet March 1st, but as far as staffing, I mean, I've worked in theater, I do know some people, but I'm wondering if there's some resources uh, for staffing of, you know, people who want to work on the fringe, stage managers, designers, you know, uh, okay. things like that. And as well as what we were talking about, you know, I, I'm planning on doing some of the producing, but I might want a co-producer or associate producer. Uh, so uh, is there a way to connect with those people? Let me answer this really quickly. And then um, you three could answer and add if there's nothing that I didn't say. 
Um, Facebook groups are a huge way to get to know people in the French community. And there's several Facebook groups in our participant packet from last year that you can start to get involved in today. So add them. We're going to drop another round of Facebook groups um, and on that March 1st packet. And really, that's when people start to Mm -hmm. put together their team is right before office hours. So Mm -hmm. it won't be against the timeline. Um, Two, you could do, um, you know, you can talk to your venues. People usually have people Mm -hmm. that they recommend um, for certain things. And your venues have a whole list of people that they work with regularly. So especially for things like live streaming or tech, you want somebody who knows your space. So talk to the venue about their recommendations, and they'll also help you work out what that price should look like because they work with that person normally. And then you can build it into your budget. And then third is showing up right here to find like your cast members, your people. There are people that come to office hours just to get cast. Um, So (laughs) know that like people will be around in the community and available. John, Kristen, Layla, I know we didn't get to get to casting. It's coming up in our marketing panel in March, but do you wanna touch on casting really quick? I, I, I'm in the midst of casting um, for my project. It is, uh, it's, it's, I'm finding, as always, very frustration of just getting actors to even respond to a, uh, an audition request. Uh, kind of my, what I know is if you call 50 people to say, please come to my audition, you'll be lucky if 30 of them actually respond. You'll be lucky if five of them don't just show up that day and never contact you. So be prepared for that. And I I am a proponent of casting sooner than later. Uh, You have to decide. I don't want my people to be in another fringe project. Mm. I don't wanna deal with uh, trying to schedule because you're in another show. And that's very important to me. Um, you know, really, we're all going to be using non-union people. I'm sure there's some equity actors who just want to fly under the radar. Um, c- casting, give yourself a, a, a month of th- that I'm casting during this process. Um, and d- expect to be frustrated that people will not respond, even though you're mm-hmm. responding exactly as you get an email, they won't do the same. That's, you know, that's, that's my- I really wish I had talked to you last year, John, because I really <laughs> could have used that advice then. Uh, I'll tell you that. I had a casting snafu after casting snafu with everything that was happening. I was like, I, I think I'm gonna start. I, I, I interviewed my director in May I interviewed three different directors and you'll always find people that want to direct. And I was specifically hoping to find an Arab American director as well. Um, and I, I found three excellent candidates. The one I picked, Miju is extraordinary. I was very lucky to have such a gifted person and she just brought it to life. Um, but then we did casting in late June and for uh, we like just did the session because like, oh, it's niche. It's all Arab American parts. Like this is just you know, who am I going to find that's going to take longer than this? So we did that like mid June, late June. And then I had a ridiculous casting turnover during July from that cast. And finally, I think we only had two weeks of rehearsal with what the actual final cast was. And then we did five shows. It's also a very small community. And usually there's going to be a one degree of separation. If there's someone who I really don't know, but I really want to cast them, I will reach out. I'll say, Kristen, do you know this person? Can you give me any insight? And you don't, and don't go to the person who's going to be like, they're fabulous. They're wonderful. Say, I want the truth. And they're like, they're a pain in the ass. They're going to give you trouble. It, we're a small community. And that's really important to mm-hmm. me. I will kind of go for a reference on someone who I don't know that I know has mm-hmm. worked with somebody else mm-hmm. to get the skinny on who they are. Because you don't want to spend two or three months with someone who's going to make your life miserable. Can I also say that for my show, it was basically an ensemble show built around the lead and the lead had to leave the show. So know if you need an understudy, be willing mm-hmm. to have an understudy. That was a big thing I learned. Have an oh. understudy. Okay. I think, and- oh, go ahead. I think just because of time, I'm so sorry, guys. We only have five minutes left and I want to get to more questions. And I think that 
a lot of these questions I think are so good to be bouncing back and forth at office hours. And I think coming on Wednesday and talking about your specific issues that you're developing, such a great place to meet people and brainstorm and be like, oh, I'm having that problem too. How are we going to solve it? Oh, we could cast together. Oh, we could like do, we could break up the work. Like you're going to start to find those people as you start to come into the community. And so if you don't have the answer to every question right now, it's okay. You probably won't. And, and like Layla said, things can happen last minute or things can happen at really ahead of time. And, it's, mm -hmm. and I love that you're planning so ahead of time, but know that that will also come with more years of fringe experience too, is knowing what the rhythm is and you're figuring that out right now and to have grace with ourselves. Um, I'm going to, uh, Ruby, do you want to ask your question? And then I have one more before we close out. Hi, my name is Ruby. Um, my show is called The Ramon Show. I do a drag character based off my alter ego. I'm Puerto Rican. He's Puerto Rican. That's what he looks like. So I was going to ask a question about outdoor space because I used to perform at festivals. I have giant wand, bubble wand, for a thousand bubbles so people can run through it. So my question is about that outdoor space or school with playground. You know, um, how I can... That's the reason I want to do outdoor. It's not because I'm like, oh, I just want to save money. It's because like wet bubbles on stage is too slippery, <laughs> you know. So my question is about that, uh, the space for the school. I like that idea because I'm trying to re-educate people how to love themselves and be their own spiritual cheerleader, you know. And I so think, in terms of venues, yes, go ahead. I'm going to give perspective from the French perspective. And then I know Kristen can speak to it from a producer's perspective. But if you're looking to do a, sh a venue that is not in the fringe zone or not one of it, it has to be in the fringe zone. So um, know that there's the boundaries. And um, I think Lois can grab that that zoning uh, article really quickly and drop it in the chat. But basically, it has to be within the fringe zone and you need to get permitting. So there's a process on bringing your own venue. Um, into the fringe that can be walked through by, by working with support. Um, we're also going to do an immersive panel, um, which is going to be coming up. Um, and so we'll be talking a little bit more about that process as well. Carly's on it. Oh my God, Carly, you rock. Um, there's a, a lot more uh, uh, of that we can speak to as far as like how to find that space um, during that panel. And that panel is coming up quite soon. It's not, it's not too far off where you won't be able to find that. Kristen, do you have any advice either? I think it's just kind of pounding the pavement and finding the right space, right? Yeah, it, it really is. Um, like I can, the school I can speak to is is not as golden as it as it sounds. It's the school. The school is very is not is not cheap. If you depending on what space you want, we we ended up we were supposed to do it to and I'll like our my horror story. We we used it one year for our first immersive show very successfully. It was great, and we sort of I think got a little lucky because. We ended up using far more of because they kind of the way that you could rent compartmentalized pieces of the school and we ended up needing to use more than we originally booked and we asked and, and it was fine but we didn't i think we got away with using more than we actually if we had applied for all the space you know um the school ended up being not the cheapest and not the cheapest venue because it's so big something like and not to knock off any like i think a park things like that can be a little more but the school was was quite um was expensive and the second year we were doing a show there and we lost we lost it we lost the venue um which was a, we i had a, ter a horrible team member who was in charge of it who basically like bluffed that he was handling it and was not communicating that it was that he wasn't getting wasn't making it happen with the paperwork and everything and we literally showed up to our preview performance and we couldn't get inside the venue <laughs> <laughs> um but we but we we got it we both jen Gre greg and jen craft saved our butts and we moved and we uh, had a very successful award-winning show. So it And know, a lot of theater yeah. spaces will allow for things like bubbles or fire okay. or things like that. Yeah. You just have to ask that up front. Yeah, sorry, I kind of did okay. in the school. Yeah, no, look for, and a lot of, there are some venues. We did um, our two shows this past year. We did at the Anthony, Men are they a venue again? Anthony Mendel? Uh, 905, oh, yeah, so. 905 Cole. They have a great, there's a, they're called the 905 Cole space. Yeah, I think it's yeah. that. And there's a lot of, there's a lot, like, look at our venue list, start to ask questions about what is allowable. Start then, with the existing venues. Yeah. If, you're, if you're new to Fringe, I would recommend doing that unless you're already experienced in booking outdoor venues and bringing your own immersive spaces. 
or it's integral to your storyline. Um, and in that case, you're gonna do a lot of learning and we're gonna try and provide some of that education, but it is a process and it is allowable and people have done it. And you can talk to them individually, I think, maybe messaging some people that you've seen who have brought their own venues offline, seeing if you can buy them a drink um, and chat it through. I know we gotta go, go I'll just say the bottom line is just ask. Like if you're looking for a non unconventional um, venues, you never know. And when we did Unreal City, we had 19 locations on that show um all over theater row that you traveled to and so we and we uh, and some were street corners and some were rented venues it was all over the spectrum but we didn't a lot of that show we developed based on the venues we could get like it kind of so be open-minded know that you might find something that's not quite what you thought so be ready to maybe if you're to adjust to make it work there you might end up with something so much cooler than you ever even thought if you're open-minded about it but always just ask because you never know and it'll okay, also cool. likely be more expensive. Like just putting that into people's minds, immersive site specific work doesn't necessarily it mean adds more, up. and it no. could actually mean way more expensive. So mm -hmm. just kind of decide if that's a very integral moment. Okay, I really, are a good place to start. I really wanted to um, quickly mention, we forgot to address um, Lori's um, idea. So could we do a quick round of uh, non, uh, non monetarily, like nothing you would have to buy that you could have as like a Kickstarter um uh a uh, uh, thing that you would um like add as a, a reward my first thought is that i had a show that i saw a show that was like hey we'll write you guys a poem if you if you spend ten dollars it was like they emailed a, a direct poem from that person because their show was about poetry is there any other quick ideas that people have used for like gimmicks for their show for like uh, kickstarter or fundraisers specifically for giveaways like for yeah. donation stuff Mm -hmm. um, I think it, I, I'll say I think it ties back to the whole what we were talking about with marketing kind of the same idea it's some shows it's easier than others if you have a show where you can come up with something that's very easy to give away or accessible um, if you're doing anything that's it's immersive or has audience engagement you can you can literally offer them to be in your show like you, you write in a, a, a thing where they get to be a featured audience member or a thing like that but obviously that only works if that's what the, the show is but I think back to yeah any any kind of anything that can be physically tangible for your show um or if you can create any sort of vip situation if you can create any sort of like um you know front row you know priority seating or you get a little giveaway back goodie bag back to the gimmicks or you get a photo op with the cast those are all like vips things you can create um that can be a thing as well all right, it's 2.03 and we gotta go. Um, I think that we should go. So I am so glad that everybody was here today. We, I cannot, I love talking to the three of you. I could talk to you guys for hours and hours and hours. These are amazing people. If you want to contact any of them to ask any further questions, you can always go through their Fringe page. So look at their names, look up Kristen Boulay, look up Layla, you could do it that way. Um, I think that that would be a great way if you are interested in um, asking any questions about hiring or things like that. Um, all right. I am going to put some last minute uh, announcements through. Um, I know that Carly is going to drop the events um, blog, which is now called the News Center because blog was confusing. That is our news center of our website. So it's hollywoodfringe.org forward slash news. Everything that goes out and more um, in our newsletter it goes out also on our news section of our website. That will also include the events that we are dropping there. Every link to register for every upcoming event is in there. And there's a link where you can add it to any calendar, Google, iCal, any of the calendars that you use digitally, you'll add all of the events in at once and there will be reminders for them coming up. So please do that. Um, come to our other shows, come to The Plunge on Wednesday for office hours. Don't forget your Vax card, your mask and your um, ID because you need to be 21 plus. Register for The Fringe. Make sure that you will get your show in by April 1st to be a part of our Fringe guide. Very important that you do that this year. We are doing a physical guide. It is printed um, and we need everybody to get their stuff in in time. Um, so much more information coming out, uh, but you know what? This is all we got time for today. Sign up for our emails. We really like to see everybody. Bye. See you guys later. Bye.